I, I would only correct uh, Susan on one thing. Well, I'd correct a lot of stuff in that tape, but that's a little overblown. But uh, she mentioned the name of the program is World News Tonight. It's actually World News with Charles Gibson. <laughs> And once they changed the name of the program to World News with Charles Gibson, my chances of getting the job improved immeasurably. <laughs> and so I was very grateful that they did. They say a, a man is known by the company he keeps, and I did cover Congress for eight years. And when I got there, I gravitated right to Koki. She was the company I kept. Simply A, because she's awfully nice company, and B, I kept asking her questions. Uh, what's the difference between an authorization and an appropriation? I didn't know when I got there. Why does the House have a rules committee and the Senate doesn't? What's it mean when they have a motion to, to recommit? And what's the strategy there? She was a human textbook on Congress. And I was her student. And it occurred to me that I really ought to be up here saying nice things, introducing her, until I found she won the award seven years ago. And then I... <laughs> I didn't know uh, Sal Tyshoff, but he was indirectly influential in my life. Uh, my parents were news junkies. I knew I wanted to do something in my life that would impress my parents, because after all, we do go through life trying to prove to our parents that we're worth a damn. As a family, we watched Huntley Brinkley every night. The news was our dinner table conversation every night. And while in my senior year in college, I happened upon the broadcasting magazine yearbook edited by Saul, and enumerated therein was the name of all the network correspondents, about a hundred of them, if memory serves, and I thought to myself, I want one of those jobs, and I'm going to spend my life going after one of those jobs. A rather quixotic notion, to be sure, but I remember distinctly sitting there with that yearbook, avoiding writing some paper, I'm sure, uh, and thinking to myself, I'm going to spend my life trying. And I have been fortunate, very fortunate, as the prayer book says, fortunate in a way that passeth all understanding. I think back at all the times I've screwed up in 42 years in this business and marvel that I'm still employed, much less getting awards like this one. Everyone up here has made reference to the fact that this is not a good time for our business. Uh, I associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman from the Washington Post totally. Uh, what he said is terribly important. This is a terrible economy, of course, but the economy simply exacerbates problems in our journalism business that have been building for years. And it is worse, perhaps, for my print brethren, but it is bad for all of us, and I don't know how it's going to resolve itself. But at my core, even with the plethora of opinions that are now in the marketplace, with the cacophony of voices, with bloggers and citizen journalists around every corner, I believe in a fundamental way, actually, that the mainstream media is more important than ever, the much maligned mainstream media. Those bloggers and citizen journalists, no question, have their role. It was interesting to see a, a blogging journalist called upon by the president at a news conference. But that role, I still believe, is at the margins. Overall, I truly believe quality and experience will out, not in the short run, perhaps, but in the long. People know intrinsically where the quality is, and they realize they need someone with 40 years' experience in journalism putting together their front page. They quickly differentiate between someone who knows what he's talking about on the tube and someone who doesn't. They've just come to believe that they can get the news they need for nothing. I think we have made a terrible mistake giving our stuff away. Why should someone pay 30 bucks a month for the New York Times when they can get it for free on the Internet? Why can't we stop the aggregators who rip off our work and distribute it for nothing? I don't know the answer to that, but I know there's got to be an answer. It probably will come after I'm gone, but I want it to come quickly. One of the joys for me is being one of the judges of the Livingston Awards every year. It's a series of awards given to young journalists under the age of 35, and the, the admissions that we get, the submissions we get, are just absolutely stunning how good they are. There is great journalism being done by young people and older people, but it's great to see the younger people coming along. But so many of the entrants now tell us that their editors or their producers can't afford to give them the time to produce the kind of product that they think is worthy of an award. I want those people to know they have a career in this business. I want them to know 
Someday they'll collect a pension from the paper or from the broadcast operation they work for. I don't want them to be thinking about taking a buyout. So I've been asking our digital folks for a couple of years now, why can't we stop others from using our product? I was so glad to see Time Magazine take up the question last week. I was glad to hear Len talk about what has to be a new paradigm for the way we pay for our, for our business and the way we make our money. The economic problems that plague our profession will get solved in time. Smarter minds than mine will solve the problems. When someone does come up with the answer of how we better monetize the product that we spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year reporting, that person, above all, should be up here collecting this award. And I suspect Saul might even come back from the grave to make the presentation. <laughs> it is that important. It is that important not just to our business. I think it is that important to the country. In the meantime, I thank you for giving me this award. I hope somewhere my folks know that you have. They would be proud. I know I am proud and grateful.